This episode 36 of Inner Demons. I'm going to get straight to it. But before I do, let me just say this. So those of you that watched my live last night, you guys already know it didn't make the cut. What can I say, man? I'm a stickler for perfection. And although they'll never be perfect, hopefully this one will at least be good enough to get it out to you guys tonight. So let me get straight to it. So at the end of episode 35, I told you guys about the situation that happened between me, Shadow, and the Africano. The Africano that never talked. You know, there were, like I said in episode 35, there were several occasions where I was in the shower and I tried to reach out to this Africano. I tried to get him to, to talk, to acknowledge us, but he didn't. And I figured, you know, that's cool. Either this guy was somebody that didn't want to be bothered with the politics or he was a lightweight J-cat. And what I mean by that is, for those of you that have been to prison, you guys know what I'm talking about. Sometimes you're running these individuals that they'll lightweight J-cat off at times. And then at other times, you'll be like, man, this motherfucker's the smartest motherfucker in the world. You know what I'm saying? So he was one of those type of individuals. So like I said, when this guy came out to the yard and me and Shadow were posted up on the checker box, by the checker box, there was just something about the way that he walked up to the window and paused that made me feel like there was something wrong with this cat. And my surprise by what happened, I'm not going to lie, somewhat. But then again, just based on the fact that he wouldn't communicate, that right there, you know, sent up red flags. It gave me reason to keep an extra eye on this dude. So that's why when he did that, when he came up to the window and he just kind of stood there and looked around, it was odd. It wasn't, you know, he didn't walk up to the window and acknowledge us. He didn't nod his head and say like, what's up? It was none of that. He just kind of stood there, looked, and then backed away from the window, got his cuffs off. And, you know, when he did that, that's when I told Shadow, hey, keep an eye on this dude. Watch this dude, man. There's something about this dude that ain't right. And sure enough, this motherfucker came up out of there like a bat out of hell. And, you know, he's straight J-Cat. Like I told you guys, when we were proned out and we were on the ground, I told him, hey, you know where Nathaniel's, right? And he just looked. He looked right at me. He smiled. The motherfucker was missing a tooth on the top. He smiled. Big ass smile. Wasn't no Colgate smile. <laughs> J-Cat smile. And he didn't say nothing. So I was like, okay. So at least from that point on, we knew what time it was. And, you know, that was the end of that situation. But unfortunately, as a result of this right here, me and Shadow both knew that it was inevitable. It was going to happen. We ended up getting split up. Now, they moved the homie to another section. And, you know, for those of you that have been in situations like this on level four yards, you guys been in the trenches, you guys have been in, in, in wars where you guys knew that when the gates popped, it was on and cracking. Or, you know, that you guys were going to have to go put in some, some type of work or it was just on. You, you guys that have been in those type of situations, you know what I'm talking about. When you get, you're with somebody that, somebody that's solid, that you can depend on, somebody that had your back, somebody that was right there with you and got off. It's it's a morale breaker when they split you up. You know, Shadow was a soldier. And what I liked about the guy is like what I told you guys is, you know, I consider myself a leader, I consider myself somewhat of a, of a strong-minded individual. And a lot of the times I used to have to, you know, give that strength to some of my other cellies. Like my first cellie straight off, off the bat, the dude wasn't a leader. He was a follower, but he had just, there was nothing about the dude. And I don't mean to slam him like that, but it's like, man, we're in this situation together 
It's like, bro, sometime come through, you know, observe something. Tell me that you've seen something or think of something that can make our situation better. I was always brainstorming, trying to trying to figure shit out. I would see stuff, you know, and or I would hear something and I would put him up on game. He never was. If I didn't catch it, it wasn't going to get caught. That's what I meant. Shadow, he had a he had a mind of his own. You know, he was a thinker like myself. And sometimes when, you know, a situation came up, you know, he'd have he'd have an answer for it. Hey, let's try this, homie. Or what do you think about that? And that's, you know, that's something that's admirable right there. That's that strong character is good character. And when when they took the homie, I'm going to keep it real with you guys. I've been in situations by myself and it wasn't like I needed somebody to hold my hand or be there with me. B was going to be all right. I'm going to keep going out doing what I got to do. But when they took him, you know, for a couple of days, I had to readjust get back in my old routine of being by myself and focusing on what was going on by myself. And, you know, it was, it was, like I said, it was a morale breaker. Took the homie and, you know, I knew he was going to be okay, but I still worried about him. I took him up under my wing and, you know, I just wanted to know that, that the homie was going to be okay. I knew he was going to keep going the yard and he was going to keep doing his thing. I wasn't tripping on that as far as his, you know, his commitment to the people, as far as being on the team, he was straight. We had many conversations in the cell where we, we talked about stuff and just listening to his point of view or, you know, his his feedback on certain things. You can read an individual. You, you can un you understand how an individual thinks, his characters, his flaws, his strong points. And these were things that that I identified in him. You know, we, we didn't just sit around in the cell all day and read fucking novels and just play grab ass. You know, we didn't we didn't waste our time like that. We were always trying to do something productive and being in a situation like that. You always got to be on your toes. You always got to be thinking. So. I just wanted to know that the homie was going to be around some other cats and that. You know they were gonna they were gonna look out for him, and you know somebody asked in one of the lives if if I still stayed in touch with him. And for a while after I paroled from Corcoran, we were in touch. But over the over the years, I lost contact with him. So, you know, somebody like that, when you get into to a situation like the the Corcoran Wars, or like I said, some of these level four yards, and you've been around somebody that, you know picks up a weapon and, and and you guys go together and you guys go put in work, somebody like that, those type of relationships, they can last for a lifetime. So, you know, it's unfortunate I lost contact with the homie, but during the time that I did keep in touch with him, he was doing good out there on the streets. He got a job. He was trying to, you know, he went out there, he, he ended up having uh, another baby and he was, he was trying to focus on just trying to be a father and keep his freedom you know so he was a good dude but anyway you know being back by myself i had to go back in pelican bay mode and you know what i mean by that is you know I, i've told you guys about some of the other stories some of the other situations that i've been in up in pelican bay i've been in pods where there were a lot of homies we had a pod where there was like six got four hermanos, maybe two Southsiders and two Africanos, but we had that pod sold up. Then I've been in other pods where I was the only one. There were nothing but Mexican Mafia members and Aryan Brotherhood members. So, you know, I had to be on my toes. And this was a time when the there was no door policy up in Pelican Bay. If the doors popped open by mistake, you came out and you rushed whoever was on the tier. If they were an adversary, if they were part of, you know, the opposition or they were a so or the associate or a sympathizer. So I had to get myself back in that mode. And, you know, I was okay. I was, I had never during the entire time I was in Corcoran, never thought about tapping out, never thought about not going to the yard, never considered, you know, doing anything that would dishonor 
my my commitment, my resolve was strong. I, I'm not the type of individual that would ever tap out. It's not in my DNA. If I fuck up, you guys are going to have to remove me. You know, if I'm in a situation where I'm faced with a lot of adversity, like the one that I was in, I'm going to be okay. And I've said this before. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep saying it. Your, your, you know, your integrity and your honor, your resolve, as far as the things that you believe in, the things that that you are committed to, they shine the brightest when nobody's looking. You know, the the first celly that I had, you know, as soon as he bounced, right away he locked up. He didn't go to a, another yard after he got into a cell by himself. That was it. So, those are the weak type of individuals that I'm that you know I'm re referring to. That those those kind of individuals. They're on borrowed time. Anyway, so I got I got myself back into my routine, my own individual little routine that, that I've always, you know, I was used to. Most of the time I spent in Pelican Bay, I was by myself. I had cellies here and there, but I was used to doing time like that. That's probably why I got fucking PTSD and, you know, a lot of the times when I got out, I was real antisocial because I was used to being by myself, not really socializing with other people and just, you know, finding ways to 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 keep my mind strong. That's that's Pelican Bay is another prison that if you allow it. If you allow it to break you, it will. You don't have to deal with with the war aspect of it you know going out and, and fighting and, and all that unless you know you get a celly or something like that but for the most part pelican bay will test you as far as being locked in a cell all day for years and not being able to see your loved ones and it, it you know a lot of guys that's why a lot of guys debriefed a lot of guys, they tapped out because they wanted to see their family. They wanted to get on the telephone and make a phone call. They wanted to go out to a visit and not be sitting behind a plate glass window and be able to, to, to embrace their loved ones or, or touch their kids. So, you know, Pelican Bay tests you in a, in a different way, but I was used to it. I, I, I've i done years up there in Pelican Bay. Anyway, so... One of the things that, that I really learned about Corcoran, though, is that, you know, prison is is a lot of being in prison. You get used to routine. You get used to things happening a certain way and you fall into these patterns. And, you know, for the most part, when I when, when I hit Corcoran, being in this environment, I try to acclimate myself. I try to fall into a routine. but that that's dangerous in that situation because every time that I assumed something was going to happen a certain way, or I thought this guy was going to go to yard with me, or I thought they were going to run, run yard this way, or I thought this was going to happen that way. It ended up somehow they ended up flipping the script and it happened a different way. You can't allow yourself to become complacent like that to where you know, you start assuming things and then that's when you start making mistakes. And when you make mistakes in situations like that, it could be deadly. So I just learned how to take things as they came instead of trying to get myself into a rhythm, into in, into those type of patterns. However it came, however they ran yard today, that's how they ran it. However, whoever I went out with, that's who I went out with. Instead of always trying to, to you know, to figure it out before it happened. And, but that's all part of security. You know, those habits were all part of security, forethought, foresight. So anyway, like I told you guys, after that situation right there, they ended up splitting us up. Homie went over to another section and I stayed on walk alone for 30 days. Walk alone was fucked up. You go out to the big yard and you're by yourself out there and it's the hours that are fucked up because during the daytime, they're running the regular yards. They're running the, the group yards. So there were a lot of us that were on walk alone. So we're on a rotating schedule. You're supposed to get yards so many times a week. You're supposed to get so many hours out. That's 
CDC rules. They're required to let you out so many days, so many hours. But because there were so many of us that were on walk alone, those of us that were going out, getting off and, you know, that same guys that were in the same situation I was in, they went to, you know, they went to the yard, they got off several times and then they'd end up going to committee at some point and committee would tell them, you know what, you're falling into a, a consistent pattern of continuing to assault other inmates. So we're going to put you on walk alone. You know how to play nice with others. So sometimes they come at two in the morning. Sometimes they come at three and, you know, I get my breakfast out there and it's fucked up. You're out there on the yard. You're trying to work out in the dark out there. It's cold as fuck. And then they come out there and try to give you your breakfast. They, you ain't got a spork. You don't got nothing to eat with. So literally you're standing out there. If you fuck with the with the fucking oatmeal, that grimy ass oatmeal, you're eating that shit with your hands or, you know, you take your milk, drink your milk, tear, tear your milk carton up and then make a little like a little uh, spoon kind of type of thing with the with the milk carton, with the piece of cardboard. That's all you can do. So it, it was fucked up, but I'm sure there were a lot of people that probably liked to stay on walk alone because they didn't have to deal with going out and fighting. So anyways, I want to say it was probably about, I was coming up to my 30 day review to where I was also going to be eligible to go back to the yard once they cleared me again. I think it was like 28 days, somewhere around there where they took me back to committee. So I go back to committee, I go in there and I get the speech again. But this time they're like, you know, they go, for those of you that don't know what committee is, let me just give you another quick breakdown of what it is. So committee is, ICC, it's basically, it's a, it's a, a committee of people that work at the, at the institution. You'll have the, the associate warden, you'll have somebody from, from gang intel, IGI, you'll have somebody from mental health, a counselor, and then there'll be various other uh, CDC employees and they'll sit in there and they'll basically go over your C file and your program, your yard needs, your program needs, whatever it is. Mr. Mendoza, you, we see that you're a parole violator and that you have an outdate of such and such. You're, you've been here since this date. It looks like you have been in trouble several times for physical altercations or you got caught with a weapon or whatever the case is, they'll go over your entire history at the institution, a little bit about your past history, and then they'll address your program needs. At that time, that's when they took me off. It looks like you've been on walk alone for 30 days. So we're going to go ahead and take you off walk alone and put you back on a group yard. And we'd advise you you know, this is the this is the time where I get to sit there and just laugh while I'm listening to these people tell me that, you know, this is the time, Mr. Mendoza, where, you know, we'd advise you to go out there to these yards and get along with these other inmates. Because, you know, if you're not able to go out there and get along or if you continue to go out there and assault other inmates and continue to be a threat to the safety and security of the institution, we're going to put you back on walk alone either for 60 days, 90 days, or maybe indefinitely. So you need to go out there and get along with people. Go out there, get your exercise on, do whatever you got to do. Keep yourself out of trouble. Are we clear on that? We'll see you in 30 days. Yeah, right. Okay. You know, you sit there, you listen to these people and you laugh. The whole time I'm listening to this dude, I'm just saying to myself, come on, man. You guys know that you're the ones playing this game, putting known documented gang members out on the same yard. You guys are having a field day. It's like shooting fish in a barrel, shooting people out there that are basically just trying to survive in prison. It's, it's a fucked up situation. Half these dudes that are going out there that are fighting, they're going out there and they're doing what they have to do because those are prison politics. It's not their war. They're involved in it because of where they're from. They don't even know why they're supposed to hate these individuals that they're going after, but they're just from two different, from two different geographical areas. 
in California. And a lot of them are youngsters. That's the messed up thing. You know, over there, I told you guys, Snowman was a youngster that ended up getting killed. He literally had a couple weeks left and he was going to parole. But, you know, because of the politics and because he's supposed to be a tough gang member, he's supposed to have all this, this pride, you know, and, and go out and engage with your supposed enemies. That's what he did. And that's what he continued to do, despite the fact that the homies told him, hey, bro, we got this. Go ahead and go home, man. Kick back. You're, you're a parole violator. You put in your work already. You don't have to continue doing that. Just go ahead and kick back. We got this. But he was like, nah, you know, I can't do that. That's that's not what, you know, it's contrary to what I believe in. So he, he ends up going out there and getting killed. Some of you asked if I was... If I was there during the incident when the homie got shot, when you said the homie from Oakland that got shot and killed out there, I know you're talking about, you're talking about, I believe his name was Toro from Oakland. His last name was Martinez. I believe his first name was Jesse. That was an NF member. And he was the individual that he put hands on the, on the cat he was fighting with. And when he turned to walk away, they shot him in the back straight. That was that was a straight homicide right there. That was one of the big one of the big um, parts of. So when they did this big investigation later on, which I'm going to get into in my next episode. And, you know, they, they, they had everybody that fought was part of the big investigation. They talked to all of us, everybody that was there in Corcoran. But there were certain incidents where people got shot with the mini 14 or people that got killed. There were like seven or eight incidents that, that were highlighted and his was one of them. But when they addressed that incident that happened with, with Toro, it's like they weren't even talking about that fight. They were talking about another fight. They didn't even address the fact that he got shot in the back when he was walking away. It was like they were talking about somebody else. It was crazy, you know, because obviously me being involved, some of the lawyers that were litigating that case came and talked to me. They talked to everybody that was involved. Some of us didn't want to get involved. Yeah, I was there. I went out there. I got into several confrontations and that's it. But I have no interest in being part of the case or nothing like that. So for those of you that that were asking, yeah, that was Toro from Oakland. And, you know, that was that was a fucked up situation that happened. Those of us that were there when it happened, it, it was things like that you hear about. And it's just like, damn, you know, he was a C. Now I'm back off walk alone. I'm, I'm on regular program now. I'm ready to go back out to the yard and I'm kind of I'm wondering, like, who am I going to go out with? Is, is it going to be Mountain? And and his celly, is it going to be, you know, wet or smooth? Is it going to be lazy and spooky? But before they run yard, I ended up getting, so they had, I told you guys they had fog line a lot over there. I think it was like the next day, if I can remember right, it's like they had fog line like three days in a row where they didn't run yard. But I'm anticipating who I'm going to go out with and I'm, you know, I'm waiting for them to run yard every day. And it was like, there's no yard. It's, there's a fog line. But before they ran another yard, I ended up getting moved. They moved me to another building. And when I asked why I, why I was being moved, one of the COs said something about, he didn't really know, but he was like, my guess is it's because you're on a bottom tier and they try to like to reserve the, the cells on the bottom tiers for guys that have cellies. So they have to they don't have to bring that many trays upstairs. They try to keep the guys on the upper tiers, you know, single cells. So I guess they didn't have no other cells that were single cells in that building. So I ended up getting moved to another building. But it was a blessing in disguise. The building I ended up getting moved to was I moved into a building that you'll never see this happen anywhere over there in Corcoran. It very rarely happens where there's more than 
two or three northerners in the same pod. You might end up finding like two cells that are both that both have cellies, like four individuals. But I moved into a pod where there were four, there were four NF members and two Africanos. So there were like four homies, two allies, and all of them were with the functions. All four of them. You had Weddle from Fatamas. You had Coco from Bakersfield. Then there was Little Attic, Little Alex from Decoto. And he was sailed up with Puppet from Sakura. And then you had two Africanos that were both BGF members, Rafiki and Infuma. And like I said, both of them were with the functions. These dudes had like fucking B numbers. They were from like, they had done time back in the shit. 70s late 70s early 80s to have a b number i had an e number most of these dudes had like like i said b numbers maybe c numbers even some of them had d numbers some of the the c's that were in there but anyway so like i said it was a blessing to move into a pod where there were other homies it was like immediately i felt you know, just relieved that I was around other homies that were like-minded, other homies that were with the functions and the Africanos, the allies. It's always good to be around some good, some good allies that are part of, you know, that are on the team. So, you know, I think it was like for the next two, two days, two or three days, I was dialoguing back and forth with Weddle from Fatimas. Just everything that happened over there, you know, with my first celly, everything that happened with, with Shadow. And, you know, we, we talked about everything. The situations that happened on the yard, who was over there, what what opposition was there. I mean, we, we covered everything. So after, after we dialogued for, you know, during that time, and, you know, the homies basically told me what was going on in that section, who was over there, who was doing what. It's another the tiers, the way that they're set up over there, they're crucial because, you know, obviously those, that's who you're going to go out to the yard with. So, you know, you guys should be seeing a picture right now that shows how they set up the tiers as far as like a board where all the ID cards are at. And you can see that there's NF members, Mexican Mafia members, AB members, BGF members. That's how they keep track of who's on the tier, but that setup right there is that's how they keep track in every building. So that becomes crucial. Obviously who's on the tier with you. These are the guys that you're going to be going out and getting off with. So next door in the next section over, you had pistol Pete from Woodland was over there. Bad boy from Corcoran was over there. Then you had Guerito from Los Baños. So it was that building right there. There were a lot of solid homies and there were a lot of NF members in that building. Anyway, some of the some of the policies that they were implementing over there in that in that building were things that I, I was already abiding by. There were policies. Some of them were already no brainers. Like, you know, it's mandatory to go to yard. It's mandatory for you and your celly both to go to the yard at the same time, because I guess there was a lot of homies over there that what they were trying to do is split it up to where one would go out and, and get his money. And then another homie would go out, but they killed that because they were saying the likelihood of something happening to you is greater. If you go out by yourself, you go out and you end up getting into a two on one, you could get hurt like that. So they killed it. The homies that were doing that, they weren't allowing them to do it no more. The other thing is like if you were in a cell by yourself, it was mandatory to get a celly ASAP. Find somebody that was single cell. However, you know, we had rosters of who was who, where, who was where. So we knew we had our own way of getting word to the next building over wherever the homie was by himself. So, so that was mandatory if you were by yourself to get a celly. The other thing is one of the other policies that, like I said, we were already following is we were always the ones that would go out and initiate. If these guys decided to go out and walk around on the yard 
or go to the back or start playing handball. That was on them. But we were being told, you make a beeline straight from that gate. If they're not waiting on that line, you are to walk straight to them. If you and your celly go out together and there's two cats out there, both of you guys, whoever your celly's going to go after, whoever you're going to go after, you guys make beelines. You go straight to them. The other thing is if we go out to a yard and there were some ABs and there were some Mexican Mafia members, so all Mexican Mafia members were to be the priority. Anybody that was sympathizing with them, anybody that was that was associating with them, Sureños, whatever, but they were the ones that we were to go after first. Another policy was there was no drinking policy because of what was going on. So drinking was completely off the table. It, it wasn't allowed. And if you got caught drinking, there was going to be consequences. One of the other policies is, again, another policy we were already following. And that's if you had a weapon, it wasn't mandatory to go out and use a weapon. For like Norteños, Hermanos, it wasn't mandatory. If you want to go out there and just engage, as long as you engage, that's all that mattered. As long as you went out there and handled your business you didn't have to use a weapon. So, you know, we weren't strong arming cats telling them, hey, you guys got to use a weapon. For those of you that are parole violators, go pick up a DA referral. It wasn't being mandated. As far as NF members, anytime we have weapons, we have access at weapons. Anytime we can use them against our adversaries, our foes, the ops, it's mandatory. That's just part of the, the NF ideology. Now, another thing that, I mean, all this stuff, it, it, it was like we were pretty much already adhering to all this stuff. But, you know, for those that were on walk alone, every yard was mandatory. It didn't matter if you were going out there with somebody. None of that mattered. Anytime, as far as all the households I've been in, in all the prisons I've been in, in all the different county jails for North Daniels, it's always been our way of anytime you got any action in, in any kind of movement, you're always to take advantage of that. Because anytime you, you go outside of the household, you, you get an opportunity to see other things, to run into other people. Opportunities present themselves. They're not going to do that if you're just sitting around in the cell, not going out. Even though, again, even though you're not going out on the yard and you're not fighting with anybody, there's still there's still a possibility they could put somebody out there. So if you were on walk alone, again, anytime they came to your door, you were supposed to be suited and booted and ready to go. So one of the other things that we were already following is there was a, a strict no trash talking policy. And the NF, like always, was enforcing that. You know, the they, proper proper tier conduct, proper tier etiquette is always something that was enforced. But over there, because of, you know, we were going out and we were engaging with our opposition, we were not to ever allow ourselves to get caught up in, in none of that. If we were out there on the yard and we got off and you had an op that started barking at you, started talking shit, trash talking, you didn't respond to it. As long as you went out there and they, they will respect that, even though they'll realize later that they, you know, they, they made an, an ass of themselves by by running their mouths, by just talking shit. You not saying nothing, humbling yourself and keeping it professional. They'll respect that. It's, it's, it's respectable. Even in the building, we were, you know, we were always told to always keep it respectable and professional on the tier. And everybody that was there, everybody was game tight. Everybody was, you know, these were convicts. They were all convicts because it was as real as it can get. Guys would talk to you. Your ops would talk to you like almost like right before you guys got ready to go to yard, knowing that in a few minutes we're going to go out there and kill each other. But they would still, hey, I'm going to send you that book, uh, Boxer, that book uh, that you asked for on Nawa or whatever it was, that history book. and then. We go out and we do our thing and come back in and there would be no negative energy in the building. And that was crazy. That was it was admirable. 
all that really mattered to everybody that was there is that they went out and they did what they were expected to do. That's it. And that's how it's supposed to be. So anyway, as far as the MN members that were there in that section and some of the AB members that were there. So you had Stump, you had Payaso, you had Chato from Watts, and then you had you had Slick and another cat named Robert Lopez. And I'm pretty sure they were all Mexican Mafia. Slick, I'm like 90% sure that he was, but if not, he was a camarada. He was like a, a close associate. As far as the ABs, you had Bamboo. You had another cat named Rick. You had a guy named Rufo, and then there was another individual named Termite. Termite, I believe, was an AB, but there's a chance he might have been a Nazi lowrider. I'm not sure. But all these individuals were all with the functions as well. They're all, they were all, they were all going out. They were all active. So, like I said, the tier was a solid tier. You know, I've been on tiers like that before where everybody is solid. And those are the kind of tiers you want to be around. Those are the kind of people you want to be around, even though they're ops. It's some of the most respect being around some of the most respectable people. It's just it, it's better like that. You know, it's a it's a it's a real positive environment. It's a real easy way of doing time, despite what was going on. I don't know how else to put it to you guys or how to make it any more clear than that. So I want to say the day after I got there. I got to see how they ran yard over there. And even though it was a different building, it's, it was still run by a lot of the same COs that used to run yard. So a lot of the same faces popped up over there that I, I seen in the other building. And again, these guys, wherever yard was running or where, whatever buildings were more active, that's where the majority of the COs came to hang out. If they knew that there were going to be NF members and Mexican Mafia members going out, they'd all come over there and congregate and eventually make their way up to the tower and go up and watch. They'd be on the, the bars up there and watch as it was happening. And then when, when that was over, they'd go to the next building and watch over there. And they continue to do their place their bets. I honestly believe that the way that they ran yard, a lot of it was predicated on who they were betting on or who was the best fights, the ones that they seen were putting on the best shows. Those are the ones that they would either let out first or it had something to do with the way that they were running it, whether they were letting out two individuals, a two on four, a three on two, a three on five. It was all predicated on the way that they were betting. And I'll go into a little bit more about that in a little bit, but from what I seen and from what I observed and from what I had heard, that's how it was being done. And for whatever reason, most of the time, like 90% of the time, for whatever reason, I couldn't figure this out. They would always put the Northerners out after they would run either the, the ABs out or the Mexican Mafia members. Maybe because, you know, and I'm just, I'm assuming, I'm guessing. I don't know. Um, straight speculating. Maybe it was because a lot of us were posting up right there at the door and, you know, we weren't waiting. A lot of these other guys, they they wouldn't post up right there. They'd go walk around the yard, throw the ball around, do whatever they were, you know, whatever they would do out there and they would wait. And then when somebody come out, then they'd engage, but they wouldn't do it right off the bat. Like some of these guys were waiting for us to initiate. And that's, that's straight up. That's anybody that's been to Corcoran, anybody that was there should be able to verify that at least 90% of the time that was, that was what was happening. Now I'm not saying that, you know, they didn't want no smoke and, you know, they weren't with their thug dizzle. It wasn't it wasn't about that. Maybe it was a tactic. Maybe it was, you know, because we were the aggressors. And a lot of the times the gunners will shoot the aggressors. 
Maybe that's why they were doing it. Maybe it was a tactic. It was, we'll let these guys come after us. So if somebody's going to get shot, they're going to shoot his dumb ass because he's the one that rushed me. Maybe. I don't know. But in the big scheme of things, it didn't matter. These guys were still with the business and they were still getting off. The ABs, the, the Mexican Mafia, and the Sureños. You know, at the end of the day, it didn't matter. It really didn't matter. Because these guys went out there for the purpose of, of engaging. They knew what time it was, so... You know, they were just as hungry as we were and they were just they were with the business just as much as we were. So I want to say, like I said, I want to say it was like the, the second day that I was there in that section. I got to see how they ran yard. And again, it was the same way. They would pull whoever was going out first. They pull them out. They take them to the front of the pod. They would have them strip out right there. Soon as they'd walk out that door after they got cuffed up, they would run the handheld wand over them, the metal detector, and then they'd walk them over to the other little enclosed area where you'd strip out again, and then they let you out to the yard. So everything was pretty much the same. They were running it the same. And again, like I said, for whatever reason, they'd bypass the Northerners and they'd either let out the ABs the Mexican Mafia members, or the Sureños first. They would be the ones that would go out there first. Again, hopefully you guys seen a picture already. If not, you should be seeing it right now of how the, the housing arrangement is set up, how the tier is set up by those ID cards that identify who's Mexican Mafia member, who are, who's NF members, who are just Norteños, who are BGF members, AB members, so on and so forth. So, you know, these COs, they'll go in there and they'll look and let's let this guy out. You've got two NF members right here. And let's let these two guys out. These are two Mexican Mafia members. And that's how it's done. So the, the first two individuals that I got to see go out and fight were Weddle from Farmas and Iseli Coco from Bakersfield. They went out with Stump and Payaso, two Mexican Mafia members. And, you know, uh, they went out, obviously... We can't see it from where we're at in the building. You just you watch them go out. Then you see them bring the homies back. They, they double back, let the two homies out. They go out to the yard. And then you can kind of lightweight. You can hear it. The guns go off. Hear the alarm. And then they'll run them back in at some point. They'll come back in. Now, nobody was all beat up when they came in. Nobody was leaking. Nobody was was. Just by looking at them, you couldn't really tell anybody who really was in, in a fight. However, when Weddle from Fatimas came back, he told me, he was like, according to him, he uh he gave Stump the business and his Sally and Payaso, they just, they, they had a good fight. He said they went at it, they kept going at it. Even after they shot the second time, they almost got shot with the Mini 14. But he said they put on a good one. But Weddle claimed that, that he got the best of stump. He probably did. I don't know. Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. A lot of the times people go out there and they get in the situation. Maybe they think. But when, you, when you're looking at it, it doesn't kind of look that way. You know. So anyway, his story. So that was the first incident that I seen. So the second fight I seen, I want to say it was like the, it was next day or maybe two days later. I don't know. But I got to see Infuma and Rafiki go out with Termite, Little Rick, Rufo, and Bamboo. For whatever reason, they let it was a four on two. I heard it was a good fight, and that was just one of the COs was talking about. They were going at it. You know, these guys got packed out. Obviously, it was a two on one and a two on one, but they were out there slinging them. And, you know, these guys. It's always the BGF and the in the in the Aryan Brotherhood, they've always they got a history of going at it just like the Mexican Mafia and the NF. But these guys kept it professional too. They didn't take it personal that they got packed out. Nobody was talking shit. They just came in like soldiers. Came in, went back to their cells, and continued on with their day. It was like, you know, it was regular, it was routine over there. You know, one of the things I, I forgot to mention earlier when I was going over like the policies that 
that they had implemented over there is. So I was telling them about when I was going back and forth with with Weddle about everything that was happening over there in the other buildings and how we were going out there with the opposition and with Weddle Smooth and with Flacco from Elm Street and, and these other guys is I told them that we were getting fair ones over there, that there were situations where there was three of them and it was just a one-on-one or one-on-one. -on -one -on -one. And, you know, he laughed. He was like, bro, he's like, over here, there's no fair ones. We're not getting no fair ones and they're not giving no fair ones. So that was something that they were doing special over there. He's like, you guys got lucky because anytime we get out there and there's like four of them or there's more a whole yard there's been situations where homies have went out and there's a whole yard out there and it's just like <laughs> two on two on six or two on eight but they weren't honoring that over there and everybody knew it so you know that stayed over there in the other building if we went out with four of them now we were going to get packed out and at least i knew because i was in the cell by myself if i go out if they put me out there with four white white cats, all all four of those cats, they're gonna they're gonna pack me out, or you know the the Southsiders or the Mexican Mafia members, I'm gonna get packed out. So at least I knew that that was something that you know I I, I didn't mention earlier. So anyway, that morning when they're running yard, and I'm thinking today's I had a funny feeling like today's my day. I'm gonna get ready to go out there today. Even though I kind of felt like that the, the two days prior, like I thought I was going to go out the day before that when the Africanos went out and the day before that when the homies went out. But this, there was something about this day that I just felt, I felt it. You know, I woke up, stomach's fucked up, don't feel like eating, you know. there. And again, for those of you that got something to say about, you know, about that, say what you want. You know, that fear right there, again, it's not the fear of fighting i've done that before it's not the fear of 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 going at it with with the opposition what it is is the fear of un, the unknown going out there knowing that you might get shot going out there knowing that somebody might have a weapon you might get packed out that's what's that's the fear right there and that's fear is, fear can be good sometimes that's what keeps you on your toes. You know, if you don't have that, if you're, 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 you don't have those senses, that's your, your body's way of telling you, put your ass on a full 60. Something's getting ready to kick off. You better be ready. So that day I felt like that. I, I had that same sick feeling in the pit of my stomach. And I just felt like something was going to, was going to pop off that day. And sure enough, they come in, they get slick. Slick was by us. He was by himself. He was in a cell by himself. Now, when I seen that, there's two reasons why I knew for a fact it was going to be me and Slick. One is because he was in a cell by himself. So I'm figuring, OK, we're going to they're going to keep it fair. The COs, they're the ones that are controlling this. They're going to keep it fair since we're both single cells and they're going to put us out together. Now, the other reason why I knew is because as soon as Slick came out and they were walking him, escorting him to the front of the pod, he looked over in my direction, shot a look at myself, and I knew right there, that right there was the fucking giveaway. It was just the way that he looked. If, you know, these are these are things that you learn in prison. You learn to pick up on these types of things. These are things that you read without, you know, it, it's... Men are not supposed to have intuition like like women, but we have a sixth sense. But this is this is something different. This is something that you learn in prison. You learn how to read things. You learn how to read people. You learn how to read yards. You can tell things are going to happen by just things that you feel in the climate, in the air. So when he looked over at myself, again, I didn't know for sure, but it it confirmed in my mind that I was probably right. And sure fuck enough, I was. So they run him out. You know, he goes out. He strips out. They bring him out, want him, and they walk him over to the enclosure. They let him out to the yard.
The COs come in, and as soon as they came through the door, they were looking right at myself. So I grab my shit, and I'm ready to go. I cuff up. So they come over. Well, they asked if I was going to yard right there. That's not when. One of them tried to small talk with me, but this was after I already got outside the pod door when he went to wand me. So, you know, they walk up, hey, you ready to go to yard? Yes, sir. So I turn around, cuff up, and they walk me up to the front, uncuff me. I strip out, and that's when they pop the door open. And when I walked out, that's when one of the COs was like, hey, man, you ready? <laughs> I look at him like, yeah, I'm ready. He goes, uh, you going to fuck this dude up? And this is somebody, this this CEO right here, I never I never talked to him like that. I never, I didn't have that type of relationship with him. I had seen him. I had even seen him in the other building. He was one of the officers that would usually run yard, but we didn't have that kind of relationship. So when he said that, I just kind of looked at him and just kind of laughed. I didn't respond back. Anyway, so they walked me over to the enclosure and they take the cuffs off. And this this is this was crazy right here. And I remember this. And this is what I was going to tell you guys about individuals acknowledging you and keeping it, keeping it G. This is what you guys say. This new generation keeping it G. The G code is when, when they took the cuffs off, it's always it was always my my habit of I when I was in that little enclosure, I would walk up to the window and I look just to make sure that there was nobody else out in the yard. I knew that there wasn't, but it's still, it's something that you do just for your own security. But the thing about it was that when I stepped up to that window and me and Slick made eye contact, he looked at me and he, and he said, what's up? He didn't say like, what's up? What the fuck you looking at? Or like, what's up with you? He was like, what's up, man? Like he greeted me. And it was it was just awkward. I greeted him back like, all right, now, knowing that we were getting ready to in a few minutes, we were going to be thumping. So. So after I strip out, after we acknowledge each other, I turn around, I do a straight Neanderthal style, straight fucking cave, man. I don't even put my shoes on. I just I'm standing there barefoot. As the door starts to open, I can see him shift his stance. So I know he's squaring up. He's getting ready. The door opens wide enough to where I could slip through. I slide through and we start going at it. <laughs> so anyway, we're going at it, you know, and I'll tell you guys like this. I'm going to keep it 100 with you guys. Out of all the fights that I had, this was probably one of the best fights that I had besides the fight, obviously, where Mountain Spider, Beaver and Patches packed us out but this one right here it's, it was a one-on-one -on -one and we were going at it slick wasn't a big dude but he was thin he was cut up and he was fast that's why it was a good fight so we're going at it we're in the middle of the yard going at it and like always i navigated myself around him to where i got his back to the tower where I could see the tower. And sure enough, man, I can see like five or six faces just all up there watching and shit. They're up there watching and, you know, using us for their fucking sport so that they can bet and shit. Anyway, we start going, we're going, man. And, and so anyway, it, it's obvious that they're enjoying the fight because by now they usually would have shot and they haven't even shot the Bertha yet. I can see the Bertha up there, but I can see like five or six faces. They're just looking, they're watching. So we're going at it. We're putting on a good show. <laughs> so anyway, guys, yeah, crazy, man. So anyway, we're in the middle of the yard and at some point, point we're over there back in the corner and we're still going at it man i'm getting tired now too i'm not gonna lie and i had a good burpee hand he's tired too and he's a lot lighter than me so we're going at it and it seemed like at one point we're just taking both of us were just taking face shots so we're still going at it we're going at it and finally they bust with the bertha oh yeah they bust I can hear him fucking rack the Bertha again. We're still going at it. 
Neither one of us is dropping. We're just going, we're straight, just going at it, man. They get off with the birthday again. Oh, yeah. We're still up. <laughs> so after they racked the mini 14, we're on the ground. I can smell the sulfur in the air from the Bertha. And I can see the pellets everywhere on the, on the ground from the knee knockers from both canisters. And, you know, I'm breathing hard. I can taste blood in my mouth. I, I, I look over it at Slick. He's breathing hard, but he smiles at me. And it was a smile, like not, you know, fuck you, you're a punk, nothing like that. It was like, hey, we did that, bro. You know what I mean? We shot that shit. We were, you know, I smiled back at him. I'm like, yeah, that's right. You know, I think we were both just happy that we put on a good fight and we both knew it was a good fight. And they knew it was too, because usually they would have shot a lot faster than what they did. But they were taking their time up there. You know, motherfuckers were probably up there like, let them go. Let them go at it a little bit, man. And that's what they did. So they end up pulling him off the yard first. And then they pulled me in. We get medically cleared and we end up going back to our cell. Now, here's the other thing. So after this incident, I go back in. I obviously, I wash up. And the first thing I did was get at the homie on paper. This is what happened. Uh, play by play, everything that happened out there from the the, the CO um, making the comment in the hallway from seeing the COs up in the tower, everything that I remember, even to uh, when I was in the enclosure, in that little enclosure and Slick nodded at me. It was like, hey, oh boy, <laughs> oh boy is a real one, man. No, you know, he acknowledged me he said, like, what's up before we even started thumping? And that shit stood out to me. It's something I always remember. It was just awkward. I wasn't expecting it. But it was like, it was respect from an adversary. Two, two, two warriors getting ready to go at it and, you know, acknowledging you're up. That's what it was. So, so after this incident, went through the normal routine again. 10 days CTQ, going to the 115 hearing, plead guilty so you can come back out. You get 10 days to heal up, go in, work out, get yourself mentally and physically prepared to do it all over again. So I thought. One of the things that I had wondered about when I was in the other building was the CTQ. Who does it? Who has the power to do it? And at what point do they do it? Because when I got CTQ'd in the other building, I was thinking, you know what, it's going to be 30 days before I go back to committee. If I go back out to a yard and I get off again after that 10 days, am I still going to be able to go back out? Or are they going to or can they CTQ me at any point in between? Well, I found out I went to my 115 hearing and the lieutenant that heard the 115 put me on CTQ right there. 90 days. So. I knew I wasn't going to be going to yard at least officially if unless they let me back out for at least another 90 days, which, you know, I would have liked to have kept on going out straight up, you know, was something that the homies, I knew the homies would continue to do until they got CTQ, which eventually they did. But, you know, I wanted to participate. I wanted to go back out there with the homies and continue to do what was expected of me. But I couldn't, not being on CTQ. So... You know, that's 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 what happened. Shout out to Slick. Got nothing but respect for the individual. And, you know, the next episode, I'm going to talk a little bit about how everything kind of came to an end, how the investigation kind of it blew up. There was a couple there was a sergeant and lieutenant over there that didn't like what was happening. They seen that some of us were being used for their own sick purposes for sport it was a blood sport but you know to sit around and like i said we called it the rooster coop to sit around and watch guys fight in the rooster coop that's what guys do everybody likes a good old-fashioned fist fight and that's cool but when you start killing motherfuckers when people start getting killed and shot in the back and people are getting targeted because of their affiliation or their race 
that's when it's not it, it you know the, the the game isn't the game no more it gets too real people's families you know they they take those losses and somebody lost a father somebody lost a son so i'm going to go into how all this kind of escalated the investigation and what happened over there once that investigation started and how some of the ter the attorneys were trying to reach out to different people and then what, what ultimately happened before they shut it down. So anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode, this Inner Demons 36. I know you guys want me to continue to keep talking about this and I'm trying to cover as much as I can. I'm trying to go into as much as I can, the mental, the physical, all the, the you know, the inside things that we talked about, the things that we've seen, how it, you know, how it felt to be there. But I can only speak on this stuff so much. I can only talk about what I knew, what I experienced. And I'll try to get through at least one more episode where I'm talking about the investigation part of it and how they came in and uncovered this whole fucking conspiracy, whatever you want to call it. And then it, it ended up stopping. They shut that part of Corcoran down. They brought in the dog cages and it was all individual yards. After that, a lot of us would end up getting shipped out to Pelican Bay. But, you know, Corcoran was it was a test of the wills. It really tested your your resolve. It tested. You know, the best of us and it separated the fakes from the ones that were real about their shit. Not just North Daniels, Sureños. MA members, NF members, BGF members, ABs, Nazi lowriders, a lot of a lot of people. It Corcoran broke a lot of people. You know, a lot of people just wanted to go home. They didn't want to become a casualty. They didn't want to die on one of those yards. And every day people were getting shot over there. People were dying. So it was what it was. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode, though. This episode 36. It's your boy Box, and I'm out.